fit here. Well, let me see. Let me turn this on real quick. There it goes. I saw this uh, slide, you know, I you know, got it from Google and whatnot, and I was thinking, you know, where do I fit? They say I'm a millennial. I didn't know for sure, you know, but I guess I am. These, this is for the workforce. So your boss can maybe be a traditionalist. You know, he's up there, right? Maybe a baby boomer. I know we got a big crowd of the Generation X, right? Gen X, as you guys call it, the millennials. And there's a new one called Gen 2020. Did you know that? I didn't. It's news to me. So, uh, but they are coming up, and uh, they're they're uh, definitely into their apps and social games and tablet devices, as you can see there at the very end. But we can point ourselves. This is how old I am. This is where I fit in society. But what are you really known for? Because in our hearts, what we want to be known for here in downtown Skyline is living out our faith by loving like who? Christ. Christ. That's our heart. And that has to reign from generation to generation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41, the Bible reads, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. All those generations, amen? amen. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Amen. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Yeah. When God does something, it's powerful. It's not something weak. It's not something that you go, you know, you have to guess, is that, you know, did God did that? You know, do that? You know for a fact he was involved. Yeah. Mighty power is working within him. And when we think of our generations, we think of our generation right now, and with all the things that are going on, how corrupt it is, right? Yep. There's this uh, sh uh, video here of obviously the, the shooting, if you could play it, Michelle, because we are in a different generation at these times. So check this uh, news clip. What the worst happened? A shooter is on the loose at school. At this school in New Jersey, they're preparing for the nightmare that they pray will never happen. It's called a code red. There's an acting unit in the building now. The Department of Homeland Security is sponsoring drills like this across the country to test the response of police and school authorities. It's intended to be as realistic as possible, with students covered in fake blood. The drill even included a car bomb. <laughs> The California and Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department produced this video teaching survival techniques for anyone caught in an active shooter situation. Among their advice, barricade the door if you're in a room. With desks or anything, just block it. Turn off the lights. Silence your cell phone. As a last resort, they say, improvise a weapon. Look for something that can disrupt the shooter's ability to see, breathe, or control their weapon. <laughs> <laughs> At this parochial school in New Mexico, many of the teachers carry guns, just in case. Show me your weapons and tell me what they are. 45, sir. 45. Mrs. Pastor, this is the 45. Yes, the director of security. 45. The pastor carries a 45 in a case that looks like a Bible. The principal is also one of the 38 semi automatic pistols. How many of you feel safe? No, I get your teacher has gone. All of you. No more! Stop! Security expert Bill Stanton suggests that trained dogs be assigned to schools to take down a shooter. Inside Edition producer, Allison Hall. What is stopping the shooter from just shooting the dog? Well, until you've been on the side that I was just on, where you have 80 pounds of muscle and sinew coming at you like a missile, the mm -hmm. first thing you think of is fear. And that's all you need is to buy that time to get those kids in a safe space or to evacuate completely. Psychiatrist Jonathan Sharon, director of the LA County Department of Mental Health, says many schools now have threat assessment teams that identify suspects before they strike. Comments in class, comments to other students, erratic behavior, uh, isolation, these are 
all signs that are potentially concerning. Precautions that may seem extreme, but as we've learned from the school massacre in Florida and many others, they're necessary in the world we now live in. Wow, how intense, isn't that? I remember when we were in elementary school and middle school, we would do drills for earthquakes. Yeah. But now our kids are doing drills for shootings. Wow. It's, it's totally crazy. That's in, wow. that's bought, That just blows my mind away. And by the way, just to make you feel safe, I'm not carrying a gun in my Bible, okay? <laughs> just so you know. In case you're wondering, is Paul going to make a special announcement about that? Or what, what, what is he doing this? <laughs> you know, too, much time, too many times, though, we focus on how corrupt the generation is instead of being concerned with our spiritual degeneration. Wow. But the Bible makes it personal. It starts with us. In Acts 2.36, Peter's preaching says, you crucified Jesus. He encourages us in verse 39 that the promise is for you and your children. In the NASB, where it says save yourselves from this generation, it does say be saved. But I looked at other translations. It says I beg you to save yourselves. Wow. Get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. Wow. That's the message. Really, it starts with us. We want to impact this generation, our society. But many times we don't want to change ourselves. Yeah. And so we have to start with ourselves. These things came up as I was reading the scripture, the promise, something personal. You know, Peter was going after the people. Hey, you, you, you. And then he says, there's this promise for other people, the purpose. And so my whole point today is the promise is personal and purposeful. Awesome. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, right, let's read that real quick. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it reads, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He says, you crucified him. But obviously we know that these people didn't physically crucify Jesus. How did they crucify Jesus, you think? Their sin. There you go. Our sin. Yep. I appreciated when I came to this church. I had been to a couple different ones, but when I came to this one, the brothers that studied the Bible with me, they called it out in my heart. They're like, Pablo, you crucified Jesus. And I was defensive. I'm like, no, I wasn't. I was thinking logical. I was like, no, I wasn't there. You can't put that on me. I didn't decide. I, I would love for Jesus to live. That wasn't my choice. But after studying the Bible and seeing where I was in my sin and understanding how corrupt my heart was, I was like, wow, I appreciate that Jesus went ahead and died for me because he truly loves me. And finally, I understood something that I had avoided all this time is that I finally took responsibility for my own life. Amen. That's where it starts. Are we willing to take responsibility and change? You know, he says in verse 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage you with something. If it starts with us, we got to make an incredible impact, just like right here in Acts chapter 2, where you know without a doubt that God's been working in their lives. Can people say that about us? That, wow, God is working with these people. God is working with me without a shadow of doubt. If we are, we're going to be transformed in our hearts, mind, and strength. And I want us to think this because when we think of salvation, we think, oh, God is just going to bail me out. God is like the Powerball genie. That's all I want. It's just give me the Powerball and I'm happy. Give me the, you know, salvation. I want to avoid the, the, you know, fires of hell. And I just want to be in heaven. I just want to escape and be good. But Jesus calls us to repent before we're baptized. And so we have to be transformed. And many people think, oh, well, you know, repentance just means, you know, you kind of reconcile with someone, maybe apologize to that person, something like that. But really, it's not just about being saved. It's about being transformed. Amen. Amen. That's what Jesus wants from us. Come on. He doesn't say, be baptized and then I'll live your lives. He says, that promise is for you and your children and for those to come. Awesome. So how do we transform heart, mind, and strength within our hearts? They were cut to the heart. 
There was an urgency. They were eager. They had godly sorrow. And for those of us that have done the repentance study, you know what that's about. I encourage anyone, if you don't know for sure what repentance means, do the repentance study. Because we need to pro process emotional pain in healthy ways. I know growing up, there was a lot of heartbreak in our family at times. There was just, you know, people absent. I don't even know my real father. I don't know where he's at. And he's the generation before me, right? And I don't know him. So growing up for me, it was just hard to feel anything. Because I was numb most of the time. Yeah. I was living to myself. I was a, addicted to the internet and just living my own life and, and just trying to please myself instead of really trying to care for others, trying to be involved, doing something better with my life. I just did the bare minimum just to get by. But my heart was sick. It was, you know, counterproductive to what everyone was teaching me at the time to build myself up. And I didn't have godly sorrow. My heart wasn't broken. It was callous. It was bitter. And I needed to process that. And I remember, I'll never forget, I grew up with a stepdad and, you know, there was violence in the home and I, I, I couldn't stand him. And I had these hateful thoughts about him. I even wanted to end his life. That, those were the thoughts that were going on in my mind as a teenager. And I remember one time I was studying and the, the brother sat me down and said, so, you know, the Bible says you can't hate. And I, don't, I don't hate him, but I don't got to like him either, right? I don't got to be his best buddy or anything. And I, I'll never forget this. This is one of the most um, memorable things that someone's ever told me. They challenged me. You need to go apologize to him. I said, what? <laughs> He's the one that's hurt our family. I don't know my dad. So, you know, amen, good riddance to him. That was my, you know, bitterness. But now my stepdad, I'm supposed to apologize to my stepdad for all the harm he's done to us. You got to be kidding me. That doesn't even make sense. But they're like, if you can't apologize, that doesn't show the heart of someone who repents. Mm. He's available. He can come over to your house. You could talk to him. You could reach out to him. And I remember I wrestled that with, for, with that for two days. Mm. I was like, man, I don't. And I hated my previous generation. Because I just thought there was no integrity. They were unsafe. And I didn't look up to them. I didn't have no respect for them. Mm. But I remember when they challenged me, they're like, if you repent in this way, Paul, I believe then you're ready to become a disciple and you can get baptized. But only until then you show me that. And I didn't want to do it for 48 hours. I was just, nope, I'm not going to do it. And I remember one time I saw him and I didn't even plan it. Something just in my heart told me, just do it. Stop being stubborn. Stop being prideful. Listen to your team leaders. Listen to the people that are trying to help you. Don't be selfish and bitter. And I just pulled him aside and I totally apologized to him. With tears in my eyes, I was crying. I was so nervous. I was so afraid because I didn't know if he was going to hit me. I didn't know if he was just going to yell at me or nothing. But you know, the worst happened after that because he then, when I apologized to him, I was happy. I was so relieved. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I apologized. And he just gave me a nice pat in the back. Good. And then he walked away. <laughs> and you know what I was expecting? What do you think I was expecting? An apology. The team leaders didn't prep me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Godly sorrow went right back to worldly sorrow. Right? <laughs> and I was like, man, what? What do I got to do to this guy? Well, how much more do I have to show him, right? But I had to deal with my heart. Amen. Uh, sure, I had issues with purity and, you know, lying and all this other stuff. But the biggest one was that hate, that vengeful hate in my heart. And we deal with that here in our church. Then the mom, you know, uh, repentance means metanoia in the Greek. Many of you know that. And I appreciate the heart of the, uh, you know, the 3,000. They ask questions because they wanted to learn. Yeah. Do you have a learner spirit today? Or did you come in here trying to teach us what to do? Whoa. You know, because even me, I'm coming in here with a learner spirit. I'm trying to. I'm trying to learn from you. I'm trying to learn from our fellowship. I'm trying to learn from everyone. How can I be better? How can we, you know, work together in our ministry to make downtown Skyline incredible? So I got to learn. And it takes practice. I know a lot of times I came to church 
just trying to tell people what to do. Or, you know, I'm the problem fixer, Mr. Guy, whatever. No, I'm here to learn. I gotta think differently because I need to rewire what's going on in my brain. Yeah. I've learned for many years how to do things my own way. Yeah. It was time for me to change the way I think. And that's a continual process. Amen. People are invested in us in our fellowship, not just so that we can have our own thoughts and our own dreams, we need to change the way we think yeah. about others, the way we process things, the way we do things, so that God can use us even more effectively. Their question was, what shall we do? What shall we do? What do we need to do? They were cut, they were motivated, they were eager. They're like, what do we do now? Mm. Teach us, learn. You know, I, I wanna learn, I wanna gain from you. And that's why they were told the secrets, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, repent and be baptized. Amen. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about that. We need to renew our minds. That's what's going to cause a transformation in us. And lastly, the strength, our action. What our physical abilities, right? What we do with our behaviors, our conduct. Someone mentioned that earlier today, our behaviors. We got to turn away from sin and turn back to God. We got to leave that pattern of the world and turn back to Him. Have that 180 degree principle that many of us are aware of. And we need to reprove, we need to prove our repentance with our deeds. Yeah. That was Paul's conviction in Acts 26, 20. Have it there for you as reference. He said, I prove my repentance through my deeds. So you know what's in my heart and in my action. I mean, I'm sorry, my uh, heart and in my mind. Then you know what's, you know, for my action. That's the true transformation. And that's what we want to see in this church. Awesome. We want to see everyone have this an amazing experience of being transformed. Amen? Awesome. I believe we could do it. Yeah. But it's got to come from us. We got to have that total desire to make it happen. Next up is being purposeful, reaching out to others. Because, hey, the promise is not just for us. It's for our children. Let's go to Matthew 27, verse 15. Really interesting here. Come on, come on. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. Jesus is being detained here, and Pilate, the governor, has a proposition in Matthew 27, verse 15. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one, of, uh, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus was called the Messiah? For he knew. It was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I had suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask, Barabbas, to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted out louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood. He said, it is your responsibility. You see that? He didn't want to take the blame. Mm. All the people had answered what? This is crazy right here. His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and had him over to be crucified. You know what's really bizarre about this is people despise Jesus so much and were looking to their own interests that they were willing to sacrifice a fallen generation. They said, not only is the blood going to be on us, but on whom? Our children. And interestingly enough, just to give you a little bit of more context here biblically through the whole Bible, it said earlier they were there during the festival. This was the time about the Passover, just to let you know. And this is very interesting because in Acts 2, it's the day of Pentecost. Penta 5, right? Many of us love that music uh, group, Pentatonics, and there's the Pentagon, so 5. And I did some research, and in Deuteronomy 16, 
It talks about how after the Passover, you would celebrate seven weeks. So seven times seven is 49. Plus the Passover is 50. You get 50 days to celebrate the Passover. Okay. So it begins with the Passover, but then it concludes with the day of Pentecost. Wow. So you get 50 days, right? And right here is the beginning of that. And I just already read you the end of that. And so what am I trying to say? These people, within a 50-day period, they said, you know what, you could take my kid. If I'm wrong, sacrifice him. His blood be on him, as well as mine. They were willing to sacrifice the next generation because out of envy, out of self-interest, they were promoting themselves. They were so guarded and suspicious. And no, this can't be right. I was raised differently. There's no way there could be a Messiah. This is not the Messiah. He looks too human for me. He cries, he feels. I've seen him, there's just no way. And they are like, kill him, so we could just be without of a doubt that he's dead. And I know, then I will be secure that he's not the Messiah. And that was their heart. They started with that. And so my question to you is, how do you think they felt on the day of Pentecost about 50 days later, when they heard that Jesus resurrected, died for their sins, and went back to heaven, and now that promise is for you. Ooh. And who else? Your children. Mm. This all happened in Jerusalem. Wow. The day of Pentecost was in Jerusalem. So people within about a month and a half time, two months time at most, they had already signed their kids to be sacrificed according to God, even in God's hands. But then they got this amazing promise. You can change. You can be transformed. You don't have to be that bitter. You don't have to be living in anger and frustration and hate all the time. You could be different. Oh, yeah. And the promise is for you and your children. And so they must have felt relieved. They must have felt so encouraged that, wow, I have a different outlook on life. And I'm not living the same anymore. I used to live for myself, but I, I can change and repent and be transformed. And that's why I'm so encouraged about all the young Christians that are mentioned. Yep. Because I see their repentance and how much they're willing to change yep. and go different. It's a new era here in downtown. Yeah. And these young Christians are putting some of us who've been here for a while, the veterans, yep. if you will, a, a little bit to a challenge here yeah. and call higher. Today, I was at the arch meeting, great attendance, about 25 people there, it was great. And our youngest Christian, seven days old, Hulu and Lulu George, were at that meeting. <laughs> Speak more, that's their neighbors, they brought them out, right? They're, so they're here, and what's amazing is we have to challenge them on some things. Hey, forgive others. Process this, deal with that. Mm -hmm. Talk with one another, and they're a married couple, so forgive each other. Yeah. And it was, Julio, was that easy, bro? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just giggling. <laughs> it was a challenge. But now they're transformed. It's amazing, now they're encouraging us with texts throughout the week, they're like, how are you guys doing? They're initiating the talks. Mm -hmm. They're not about themselves. And they're there serving at the meeting because they want to see others become Christians. Amen. How are we doing? You know, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, did you know that the Holy Spirit spoke? I didn't until I did this lesson, actually. I know the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. But check the scripture out in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, it reads, So, as a who says? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Wow, that was interesting to me. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors, ancestors tested and tried me. See, God takes it personal. When you're going through something, it's, you're either with Him, or you might be against them. And you, you may be trying him or testing him. Mm. Though for 40 years, they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. 
I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my way. See, God is not just concerned about your heart. He's concerned about how you conduct yourself. So I declared on oath in my anger that they shall never enter my rest. See, that was one generation God just said, you're not even going to enter my rest. But in verse 12, there's hope for us. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another only on Sundays. What? <laughs> only when you're canceling appointments. What? <laughs> only when you're around other Christians. Whoa. <laughs> it says daily, as long as it that is called today. Come on. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Come on. So it's not technically even sin that hardens your heart. It's the deceitfulness of sin. Yeah. It trips you up. Yeah. It plays mind tricks on you. It takes away your confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of us, we got to ask ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice? In the first century, those Jewish parents, they were willing to sacrifice their kids. Wow. Hey, you know what? The blood be on them then as well, if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Some of us, are we sacrificing our purity? Just saying, you know what? Oh, well. I'll deal with it when I see Jesus. Mm. I'll take shortcuts and put my integrity into question. Mm. My character, my word, my reputation, it's okay. People, they just know who I am. I'm, I'm never going to change. It's just who I am. Deal with it. I have the secret problem. Deal with it. Mm. Finances, time, are we compromising on that, on our health? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves. Because sometimes we say, I swear on my, you know what, right? <laughs> Growing up, we said that all the time to kids at school. I swear on my mom, I didn't do that. And I'm like, I, I did do that. <laughs> and I would swear. Yeah. I swear on my life. I remember one time a Latino told me, I swear on everything I love, man. <laughs> wow. On everything I love. Wow. <laughs> but they're willing to swear on their kids. I, I, maybe I've heard that thrown around, but not rare. It's been rare then, if I have. But who swears on their kids, right? And our goal is to raise up an incredible family ministry here that shows all generations. Yes. We want families of one faith. Yep. That means some of us here, if your spouse is not faithful, guess what, what the job's got to be? Got to get them to be a faithful disciple of Christ. Yep. We want everyone your grandparents, this generation, the next generation to come, for them to be of one faith. Yes. We don't want any more split divisions in the home. Yeah. We don't want any of that for you. We want the one faith, marriages to be of one faith. So that you have a standard, because when you're married to the one faith, then you have one Lord. If you don't have the one faith, you cannot have one Lord. See, that's the difference. And I think we lower the standards there because we think, well, I'll just be loving and work it out. It's okay. But it's very difficult to challenge someone to be like Christ if they don't respect Jesus as Lord. Yeah. Yeah. If they don't have that one faith, how are they going to respect Jesus as one Lord? Yeah. Yeah. So they don't got to change. Yeah. I remember me and my wife, sometimes we get into it. I'm going to just tell you everybody, right? That sometimes no. we get into a couple Never. arguments a year. No. <laughs> and I'm pretty sharp, you know, uh, with my words sometimes. And I'll say, you know, yeah, she'll tell me, babe, you got to be more like Jesus and stuff like that. You know, I don't like to hear that. It really bothers me. It just really rubs me the wrong way. I'm just like, oh my goodness, I have some comebacks for her. Well, Jesus yelled, and? I even will quote a scripture. You see right here, woman? You see right here? <laughs> It has an exclamation point at the end. What do you think Jesus was doing? Whispering that? <laughs> and, she, and my wife just nods her head. You know who you need to call now, all right? Yes. Call the trio. Call Dave. Call James. Call the. Go ahead. Because you know what you need to do. You need some help. Yep. Right. Now, that is difficult. And in the moment, I'll be honest with you, I can't admit. Uh, hopefully, I can get to a point one day when I can admit that I love being called to be like Christ when I'm angry like that. But at the end of the day, I do, I appreciate them calling me to Christ because that's the standard. Yeah. That's right. I have now someone I can look up to. Because when I was younger, I didn't have anyone to look up to. Wow. I didn't have that person that said, you know what, you could rely on me. 
I'm going to teach you the way. I can raise you up to be a man. You know where I raised up to be a man? Here in the church. Yeah. I got trained what is a man. Working hard. Getting up early. Staying up late. Sacrificing yourself. Yeah. Learning to lay down my life for others. I remember getting training, especially now it's called Faith Point, at the time it was called South City. Just to get trained in a ministry is exciting. Mm -hmm. And just to learn that, wow, I could be more than what I thought. Yep. Yeah. Many of us, we think, oh, becoming a disciple, that's just rules and regulations. And it is boring if you think of it that way. But when you think of it as, wow, I can be transformed to be someone amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the studies lately that I've been involved in, I've been telling them this. Just becoming a Christian isn't just a religion or some fad or some phase in life. Yep. Imagine your name and you put the exponent number of 100. And I encourage them right with the scripture that God can make you possibly, right? You're bearing fruit 100 times what was sown. Yeah. And I tell people, God just wants you to be a better version of you 100 fold. Amen. And people are just excited. They're like, wow. Mm. So becoming a Christian is just a better version of me even more? Exactly. I can't promise you you're gonna make a hundred times more money. Well, <laughs> get a hundred times more whatever you want, but I can bet you we can get you a hundred times of who you are. Yes. And what I, I keep lifting up to George's, but what's amazing about Julio, he shared his faith with his sister, and now his sister's here today. She's studying the Bible, I'm gonna get baptized soon in the next week or two. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Laying down his life, learning and being trained. I think we need to get excited about we could become more than what we are now. Yeah. I hope you're not settled thinking you're all fine right now. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to be stressed out. Living like, you know, with their chickens head, you know, with the chickens with their heads cut off, thinking, oh my gosh, I got a lot, you know, to do. That's not what we're trying to live here. But we want to live fulfilled lives. Yeah. Lives where we push ourselves, stretch our faith. And look at all the generations that we have to look after. The strength of this ministry right now is currently the marriage ministry. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Amen. And we have been baptizing couples, but really this should be, the strongest group in here should be the singles ministry. Yay. The biggest ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Not just us marrieds here. It needs to be the singles ministry. And us marrieds, I want to encourage you, we need to get a little bit out of our comfort zones and start reaching out to the other generations. Yeah. Yeah. We've proved we can baptize couples. That's great. But now it's time to really reach out to the other generations. Our kids' kingdom. Let's give CJ and Junior an incredible round of applause. Yeah. They did a training a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, February, right? Or January. I'm sorry, I forget. But, you know, they about a month or so ago. And I'm just impressed by them because they don't get a dime from the church. They fearlessly and tirelessly serve yeah. our ministry. They just want to give their all. And I'm so proud that they have a special, obviously, investment because now Oliver, baby Oliver, hey, in a few years, he's going to need Kids Kingdom. Yeah. But guess what? Just because Nicole and I don't have kids, that doesn't mean we can't invest in Kids Kingdom. Right. We need to invest in Kids Kingdom. Right. Yeah. Right. We need to care for that ministry. That's the maybe Gen 4040, you know, generation that we got to worry about there. Yeah. We got to get an exciting youth ministry here. Woo! We got to get an awesome team ministry in our ministry. Yeah, come on, right? We're going to ask the parents to lead that. Yeah. We're not going to hire no team leader, all right? We're not going to hire no yeah. campus students to go parading your kids around or, you know, <laughs> driving them from place to place. We want the parents yeah. to lead and to be empowered because the blood won't be on our children, all right? We got to take responsibility and say, hey, we got to raise them up. And a few weeks ago, I had a meeting with the teens and it was amazing to see them, and uh, some of them are here, and I want to give them a round of applause for <laughs> I was pretty impressed by our teens, because I was like, how many teens are out there? So we had about six, right, babe? Seven. Six, six, seven. seven? Come out, and they came to our house, and some of the parents were there, and it was great. We had pizza, and, and dessert, and the whole nine yards, and I asked them, you know, what do you like about our ministry? And what are the things that we can improve? So they said a really nice thing. Say, you know, this is what's cool about it and whatnot. But what really broke my heart, they're like, you know, one thing that we would love to see change here. And, you know, some of them are here today. They're like, people just walk right by us and don't even acknowledge us. Mm -hmm. Don't want to talk to us. Uh, possibly because we're not adults. Mm -hmm. 
And I started thinking to myself, you know what? I gotta work with the parents here, and I gotta work with the singles, and I gotta work with the entire ministry to really pull in that generation. Come on. Because they're feeling left out. Yep. Who's investing in them? Who's mentoring them? Mm. You know, for me, I'm blessed because I had a few people that were not my blood care about me. Yeah. I had a talk with the a sister who led our teen ministry, and I remember times she would give me rides all the way from Southgate all the way to where I lived in Lenox. And I remember her taking me, and there were times I just cried. Mm. Her name's Elba. She's in North Carolina right now. She's married and happily married and all that. And I, I was just talking to Elba yesterday, and she was so just proud of what you know been going on in my life, how I'm leading and how I'm taking care of my wife, and she's so excited to see the difference in me. But I appreciated that in the Las Americas, you know, the, the Hispanic ministry, people invested in me as a youth. Yep. They pulled me under their wing. They taught me. They raised me up. They shared scriptures with me and prayed with me. That helped me. These teens need the same exact thing. Come on. They need someone to mentor them and say, hey, let me pull you in. Let me help you out. Mm. But we got to work together yeah. on that. We need a millennial singles ministry, right? We have some millennials here, but we yeah. got to grow that one up. <laughs> we also have a professional singles ministry. We need an empty nesters ministry. Oh, a lot of us are getting old. Kids are moving out. Kids are getting married. What are we going to do about that? Come on. We may need a group that we may need to do something for that generation. A mature retired ministry. Come on. I was talking to one brother today. I won't mention his name because I didn't get his permission. But one brother was like, hey, you know, my plan is in five, seven years to retire in another state. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate him already getting open and getting advice now about that move. Yeah. that he's doing in five, seven years. And I encourage him. And he's... He's exactly not what you would think. He's doing so well in his life. He's not that old, actually. He's closer to my age. And he's saying, I'm thinking about retiring at a certain age. And I was blown away. I'm like, man, I wish I could be like you. you know, retire, right? <laughs> but he's already thinking, you know, I won't be able to retire here in this state, but I could retire in another state. Mm. And so I'm, I gave him a vision. I told him, let's talk and let's see what we can do for our ministry together before you leave, right? Yeah. See, all generations are impacted by faith partnerships and discipling. Yeah. I want to give you this... Uh, practical here. If you're like, well, what can I do, Pablo? You're talking in theory. That sounds awesome. I do want to help out the generations. What are we going to do? We're going to have to do it through faith partnerships and discipling. I'm proud of the Cobo Speakmore group, the South Point group. Right? These guys, I talk to them a lot. I, I'm at their meetings. This is my personal group, if you didn't know. Right, right, me and Nicole. This is our holiday dinner. We're having barbecue. It was awesome. And I've noticed something with them. We're fighting like, two, you know, like cats and dogs sometimes in our group. But what's amazing is the goal is to be faith partnerships, you know, to be united. And I noticed something. Last year, they were fruitful. They baptized the Rodriguez's. And this year, they baptized the George's. George. Is there a coincidence there? I don't think so. <laughs> I appreciate your zero, Arlene. She's like, whatever Pablo says, yeah! Where's the gun at? I want to see that, you know, 45 one special, whatever you got. Let's go. This is not just happening in one isolated group. Check this out. This is happening in the East LA marriage as well. <laughs> the partnership of the Yens and the Guzmans. The Yens are the shepherds, the Guzmans are the outreach team, right? And they last year baptized and helped baptize George and Cece Morales. <laughs> you know, pray for them. Uh, Cece just gave birth, so pray for her, recovery, that whole nine yards, that whole thing. And then last week they just baptized someone, they personally met the Guzmans in Robin and Genesis Kiroa. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so again, is there any coincidence there? I don't think so. I think these people were united. And some of us, we throw that word around like this. And I want to be now the executive for a change. Amen? All Can right. I do something? All right. When you say you want to be unified in downtown Skyline, I want you to think of this. Mm. Am I partnerable? Mm. And am I getting the cycle? Amen. Come on. All right. That's what unity means in downtown Skyline. Call it out. Well, who made you the you know, mayor of downtown and you're putting these decrees? <laughs> that's what's been effective in our ministry. And that's where we're going to go. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah.
And I just encourage everyone to have that in their hearts. You know what? I keep saying, let's be unified, let's be unified, let's be unified. But what does that mean? We, we don't do anything. We're just throwing that word around like it's a credit card. You know, unity, 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 unity. Yeah, yeah. But let's start talking, are you partnerable? Who's your partner? Yeah. I don't have one. Well, it's time to get one today. Yeah. You can't be partnerable. Yeah. And there can be discipling. No doubt about it. And that's true unity in our ministry. Amen. So if you come to me asking me to be unified, just be warned. I'm going to be talking about this. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm going to rush through this because I know I'm running out of time. But one thing that's the beauty of partnerships is when you partner, it's something that you can model and people can learn from. Yeah. People are more eager to learn about partnerships than they are to learn about one individual. That's what I've noticed. So when someone can be partnerable, it's more, you know, exciting. It's more impressed. It's a, it leaves an impression because it's really hard for people to work it out together. And so I want to encourage you with that. And here's Terminator 2, right? No fate but what we make. You guys remember that movie? Yeah. Terminator 2. I don't got time to read this, but I want you to think of this as a change as we close out. My faith will affect their faith. Amen. Does it determine where they end up? No, that's not what I'm saying. Does it, you know, is it, it, it ends with us? No. But we do affect their faith. Yeah. Yeah. Their faith. Our faith affects their faith. And so today, remember that the promise begins with you. Jesus has offered that to you. Save yourselves. Yeah, the generations are corrupt. We know that. But what about saving yourself? Are you being transformed in heart, mind, and strength? And lastly, are we purposeful? Are we going to reach out to the lost generations? Can we be partnerable and say, you know what, let's work together so that we can be a model and affect others and help them with their faith. Amen. I know we can do this if we live out our faith by loving like Christ. Love you guys.